You are a mythicist. You don't believe in a literal God-man Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee, right? Uh, or, or even an ordinary guy who walking the shores of Galilee. Uh, I think it's more likely than not. And so I don't think it's certain. We don't have the kind of documentation we need to be certain. Uh, but I think overall, when you look at the evidence, a balance of evidence suggests that Christianity actually began with a revelatory being, someone that people saw in visions and dreams uh, communicating to them from other realms. And then it was only later, decades later, that he was turned into a man walking around with a ministry in Galilee and so on. And that was done to sort of conceal the teachings and or convey them in a sort of allegorical way. And for a variety of different reasons. And so that's, that's what I think is the most plausible, uh, most likely explanation of the evidence we have, because the evidence has a lot of oddities in it. But the mythicist position is a minority position at this measure, right? Yes, it is right now. Uh, and a, lar- a lot of that has to do with the history of how this debate has gone. Um, over the last hundred years, there have been arguments that Jesus didn't exist, but a lot of them are really terrible. Um, some of them outright crank. Uh, or they were just they were just logically fallacious, or they had uh, uncorroborated fact claims, or things like this. So it was very easy to dismiss, and this has become the uh, received institutional assumption of all scholars in the field that oh, that's been debunked already. Like why do we need to talk about this anymore? But in about the last ten years, some much more serious and effective arguments have been developed. Originally by Earl Doherty and Robert Price. Uh, it's looking like a much stronger case. Uh, we've, we're getting rid of a lot of the bad argumentation and narrowing it down to the good argumentation. And I did that by getting rid of all of the bad argumentation, putting all the good stuff in one book, and getting it passed through peer review at a major academic press. And that's the first time that's happened. That happened just in 2014. So it's the first time that someone has met the standards of the field. Peers in the field have confirmed that it meets the standards of the field. So it's the first time that we're really starting the argument according to the standards of Jesus Studies itself. And that only has only been a year, really, that that's been out. So that's relatively new in that sense, trying to approach it. And so most scholars in the field that you ask have not read the book. They're not aware of these arguments. They only know about the old bogus stuff from before. So they're still operating on this basic assumption uh, that's been inherited over all this time. Now, once once scholars start looking into this stuff, uh, we are starting to see more defectors. Uh, We have about seven PhDs in the field, including three sitting professors, two retired professors, who've gone on record and conceding at least historicity agnostic. So they're actually agnostics about historicity of Jesus. So that's happening. That's happened in the last three or four years. And I think as more people engage with it, this is what we're going to see. Although there's a lot of pushback and resistance, and I think a lot of that where you see certain members of the community are doing it, they're either Christian, and so they just can't abide the idea that Jesus didn't exist, or they're integrated into the Jesus Studies academic network. And so even if they're at secular schools, their professions, their money, their grants, and donors for colleges and things is heavily controlled by Christian donors. So you don't want to piss them off generally. And also, your colleagues can punish you. If And this happened, we've seen this happen before, and this is why there's a lot of paranoia in the field about this. I actually know some leading scholars in the field who are historicity agnostics, but will not go on record uh, as such for fear of retaliation from their peers. So we saw, for example, in the 70s when Thomas Thompson uh, was trying to argue that Moses didn't exist and the patriarchs didn't exist. Uh, and when he did that, every resource is brought to bear to try and punish him for that, to try and get him removed from conferences, to try and get him fired, uh, any possible way that you can do it. You can actually, nowadays, you can do things like interfere in your department and get them buried under committee work, or you can get them in a crappy office, or you can, many ways, even if they're a tenured professor, you can make their life miserable to the point where they don't want to work there anymore. So everybody's afraid of this. There's this paranoia about this. Uh, and so I think that's also a factor right now, and people have to push, back, push past that ultimately. I don't know how much that's real and how much that's perception. Now, ultimately, Thomas Thompson was vindicated. It's the mainstream view now uh, that Moses and the patriarchs uh, were mythical. So it took a few decades, but he, his argument succeeded. But there was that initial pushback, even from secular scholars. It was messy, but the scientific community actually worked. The scientific process worked. Yeah, that's what one hopes is what the explanation is, is what happened. But <laughs> so we still have to see now, what's, where are we going to be 10 years from now after my book comes out? Um, are they going to ignore it? Are they going to deal with it? What's, what's the deal? Is there any evidence there was a Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, actual individuals and a traceable way to find out that they wrote the actual Gospels? How do we approach the Gospels? Yeah, of course, you you could just treat those names as pseudonyms or pen names, and as such, obviously, they existed. Someone wrote those texts, Um, although some of them have been edited over time. So our Luke, our copy of Luke, has been edited 
our copy of John has definitely been multiply edited, so actually it has multiple authors over time, and we don't actually know which parts come from the original author and which parts were added on later. Uh, Mark has an ending that was added later. So we, we've, they've been meddled with by multiple authors. Now, how does that determine? Do you look at writing styles? Do you look at uh, references to what was happening in certain cultures? How do you determine? Yeah, there's a variety of ways. Writing style is one. Um, for John, we can tell because the events are out of order and they've been moved around, uh, and things have been inserted, where you have where a scene clearly goes from A to B, but then there's a sudden gigantic insertion, time-consuming insertion that makes no sense narratively. It looks like someone's added that. Uh, and then things out of sequence where Jesus is walking around in one town and then suddenly he's in another town without explanation. Uh, so we know John's been meddled with. We know, for example, uh, it has two endings. Um, so it, it ends and then suddenly there's another ending tacked on and then it ends again. Just like Mark has an ending added onto it. So these are the kinds of things we look at. But also we do look at, in the case of the Mark and ending, we can see stylistically it's totally different. And, and, but that we also have manuscript evidence, which is nice to have uh, versions of it that lack that, that ending. So there's a variety of different ways that we do that. But so we know they've been multiply redacted. In the case of Luke, we know that there, we actually have two complete versions, different versions of Luke Acts. One is 10 to 20% longer than the other. Uh, and that's the one that's not in the canon. And we actually don't know which one of them is original. We don't know if one had stuff added or if one had stuff removed. Uh, so there's clearly two authors were working this text and we just don't know, um, or in addition to working this text. So we just don't know which one was the original. So that's messed up. But if you assume that they're original authors, and there must have been, we might not know their actual real names. Uh, we don't know where the names necessarily came from that were assigned. But the key thing, though, is that the names that are assigned to the Gospels are not the names of the authors. Uh, they're the names of the author's source or claimed source. Because uh, they use a Greek form for naming a source, not an author. Uh, so, so, so you say kata markon, which is how, according to Mark, that's how you say, oh, Mark told me this. And then so the, the author, whoever the author is, is basically claiming they're writing down the tradition of Mark. They're not claiming to be Mark. So the church argument that John is responsible for the words written in John is fallacious. Yeah. Oh, it's especially bogus because uh, several scholars have pointed out in the peer-reviewed literature even uh, that, in fact, the, author, the original author of John appears to have been Lazarus, or at least the gospel itself claimed so. Uh, and and there's, there's a variety of internal evidence points that we can actually show uh, that because the, the, the authors say, or they, it's the source, not the author, the uh, authors, they identify themselves in the plural, say that our source was this guy, this beloved of Jesus, and there's only one person called the beloved of Jesus, and that's Lazarus. Uh, and there's a lot of other clues in there as well that, that fill this out. And I, I have a whole section on this and on the historicity of Jesus, and it's based on actual scholarship. It's not just my own invention of stuff. And when you look at it, it looks like the original version of John was represented as being uh, someone listening to and, and copying down uh, either previous writings of Lazarus. But we can also show that Lazarus didn't exist, that he's a fictional character created to inverse the, uh, to invert the parable of Lazarus in Luke. So here we have a claimed source that didn't exist, uh, that we can show didn't exist. Uh, and that also is very common. Uh, Alan Cameron wrote a book um, on ancient myth mythography, and he has a whole chapter in there on fake sources. It was very common for myth mythical works to invent sources and claim, so-and-so told me this thing, and they didn't. So, Can we talk about Christianity and the Christ figure in terms of, of syncretism? I mean, it, is this a, a, a borrowing and amalgam? Is it... Uh, do we see echoes of Christ in the Christ story, the, the martyr for all humankind, the savior sacrifice? Do we see echoes of that? Does that explain the Christ story? I mean, it's a yeah. rather broad question. For yes, you. it is. Um, but, but you're right, yes. Uh, in large part, Christianity, this is the way to put it, that in the Roman Empire at the time, these savior, mystery, savior God-based mystery cults were all the rage. Um, every culture had them. The, the Persians had their Mithraism, uh, the Persian Romans. So it was a, an amalgamation of Roman, Romans and Persian beliefs that then became a new thing. It's not Persian, it's not Roman, it's a mix of them both. Uh, the Egyptians had Osiris, uh, and that, once again, is a mixture of Greek and Egyptian things. And we can go all the way through, and there's a variety of these, these savior deities and these mystery cults where you'd get personal salvation through... Uh, the, through the cult and the initiation through baptism and the whole deal. And really the Jews are the last, one of the last national cultures to do this. Uh, and in fact, we, if we look at the similarities of all the mystery cults and all the savior gods, and if I was a historian who was aware of all those things in, in, in let's say 10 BC and you'd ask me, what if the Jews made one of these, what would it look like? And I could describe to you entirely Christianity before it even existed. Uh, and that's kind of a giveaway. That means what that is, is the Jews decided to create their own version of this savior cult, their own version of this mystery cult. 
And they did it by borrowing the basic ideas, the basic structure of these, of these cults, and then Judaizing it. In other words, making it Jewish friendly, pulling out things that were offensive and putting in their place things that fit with the Jewish expectations. So they created a Jewish savior deity and a Jewish mystery cult with a Jewish baptism that gives you a Jewish salvation. Uh, and that's what Christianity is. And so it is, we call it syncretism. It's the, the amalgamation of, of two different cultures and ideas to create something new. Now, is this um, a, our God is better than your God, our God is more powerful than your God? I mean, were they constructing a grander, greater, more valid, quote unquote, valid deity in the face of all the others? You think? Yes, that is exactly what they're doing, and including uh, against other Jews. So the, the Christian sect is basically arguing that you guys are worshiping the false God or you're not listening to God. Uh, and so we're following the true God, we're listening to God. Uh, and, but they're doing it for everything else as well, like other, other gods. The Christians at the time were teaching that other gods, uh, non-Jewish gods, pagan gods, were all demons in league with Satan, so that they were all tricking people. So that's their, but the, they use the word for de demon just means uh, divinity. So the, the, really they're talking about gods, but they're gods you shouldn't worship. You should only worship one god. So really, uh, Judaism of the time and early Christianity was monolatrous, not, not uh, mono, um, monotheistic, because they actually believed in a variety of gods, but they believed that you should only worship one or his agent, uh, his assigned agent, which is Jesus. So it's, technically there's kind of two deities there, but there's only one that is the supreme deity and the other is just his servant. I had asked Dr. Price about the Josephus arguments I hear that supposedly validate the story of Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm, at this measure, a little more interested in why. I mean, why would someone want to mold, remanufacture, reimagine, invent mm -hmm. the Christ story? What agenda, what purpose would it serve to propagate this story down through the ages, do you think? Oh, well, are you talking about the Josephus passage? Well, I mean, or? Josephus being an example of yeah. why would someone go and manufacture or report or write something decades after the fact? Yeah. They couldn't have been there to see it first Oh, time. yeah. No, here, I'll, I'll give you another example that's, that's one of the most glaringly obvious examples of a forgery. In the 4th century, and so this is a little much lighter, much lighter, someone forged an entire correspondence between Paul, the apostle, from the, from the early 1st century, and Seneca, the Roman philosopher of the same period, uh, so they invented this whole correspondence of letters written by Seneca to Paul and Paul to Seneca, completely bogus. Um, so you, like, well, you could ask, why would they do that? Like, what's the point of this? And, I mean, for one thing, it gives authority to the teachings that they put into this book. So it's like, oh, look at Seneca, the great philosopher that these pagans revere, and he's saying kind things about Paul, so we're, getting an endor we're creating an endorsement for Paul and Pauline Christianity. And at the same time, they get Paul to say things that they want Paul to have said, and they say, oh, look, Paul said these things. And so you've got this whole construct that's basically selling a version of Christianity that someone wanted to sell at the time. Um, that's one reason that you would do that. Uh, but also just to create evidence that, that they wanted them to say, look, th look, this guy's real, this whole thing is real, here's this conversation. Um, in the case of Josephus, it's very clear that people, Christians, were disturbed by the fact that Josephus never mentions Jesus uh, or Christianity. Um, he's got this whole extensively detailed history of Judea in just that very period, um, extensively talks about Pontius Pilate and so on. Um, and other savior figures. He talks about other messianic figures of, of the Jews that were at the time, and he doesn't mention Jesus. This was very profoundly disturbing. Uh, so someone just decided, like, we need to put a little picture of Jesus in here and make it, pass it off as if Josephus wrote it so that we can claim the authority of Josephus verifying our religion. And they took this, we have, uh, it's been demonstrated in peer-reviewed literature that we've they took it from Luke. They used a, a sequence of events in Luke to create a little pocket gospel to, to insert into Josephus to basically sell the basic gospel message and get Josephus to be confirming it. So they're getting the same thing. Look, we've got an endorsement from Josephus even. Like, you know, this is, it's, this is the kind of thing they're trying to pull. And there are other examples of that uh, throughout literature, but that's, that's the main thing going on there. Let's talk about the whole Caesar's Messiah thing, the mm -hmm. charge that the Romans... Joseph Atwill is the... Invented the Christ, uh, right, out of whole yeah. cloth as a way of controlling the Jews. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> uh, I have a whole blog on this for people who really want to go in depth. And you, why you did go in depth, but I yeah. wanted to address it on camera. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, sure, it would be neat and clean to say, oh, sure, the Romans did this, we, you know, we found the smoking gun. Mm -hmm. But it just doesn't really work. No, no, it's 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 all based on Bible code type uh, reading of coincidences between uh, inevitable coincidences. They're not even telling coincidences between the writings of Josephus and the writings of the New Testament. And the argument is that that the Romans hired Josephus to fabricate the entire New Testament, and that he did this simultaneously to persuade the Jews to become pacifists and at the same time to make fun of them. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense that the, both those things are at odds, but. Um, 
No, there's no support for this at all. It doesn't make any sense. They're not, there's no consistency of style among them. It doesn't explain the contradictions among them. And all of the attempts to find parallels are often hinky in the sense that they're Atwill is basing it on his English translations. He's not basing it on the original language, and a lot of his arguments disappear once you look at the original language. Or he's using readings of the text that we know were later interpolations or later errors that were not in the original versions of the text that we can confirm from manuscripts. Um, so he's making a lot of fundamental errors like this, and I think, I think he's just delusional. So I think this is really just a, a delusional man who has lots and lots of money, so he keeps promoting this. Uh, and he can make r really expensive looking PR for it, so it looks like official stuff. Um, but no, it's really not. And this is a big problem because historians who want to enter this debate, who are pro-historicity, see that and they say, oh, look, this claim that Jesus didn't exist is ridiculous. This is delusional. Um, and they would be right if they were just looking at him. But he's getting all the press in that respect. Uh, and therefore, it's making it look ridiculous. So it makes it harder for me. I come along and I have to explain at length. As I'm not supporting Joseph Atwell. Yeah, that stuff is crank. I've got, no, but I have a serious argument you should look at. And that can be difficult to get historians to actually realize that that's the case. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I am different. I am actually meeting the standards of the field. This is not crank stuff. You should actually look at this stuff. Yes, his stuff is crazy. Don't look at it. Um, that's a difficult thing to get across. The separation of sort of the wheat from the chaff in the age of the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> you see something and you probably read the first three paragraphs and you high five and then you forward it on to 25 people. I mean, <laughs> I've heard it, the argument, though, that the Internet's actually made it made us a little more critical in one respect oh, because yeah. we realize it mm -hmm. is. Yeah, absolutely. A minefield. I mean, yeah. Do you agree? Yeah. Especially the, the most recent generations. They're more than well aware that the internet is not completely reliable and you have to be use it critically. And in fact, I think that's going to, in the long term, improve critical thinking. Uh, our schools aren't teaching critical thinking, but the internet will just inherently teach people critical thinking. I, I see that happening already. I just don't know how pervasively it's happening. Um, and, but I, I can see how that would work because you know you get burned by the internet so often uh, you know eventually you need to figure out some way to tell when you can rely on something and when not. I'm fascinated by the canonization, the 66 books of the Bible in mm -hmm. that particular canon. Yeah. The fact that God would select the people who had screwed everything else up on planet Earth and, yeah. and put the voting and the canon into their hands. It uh -huh. fascinates me. <laughs> but the broader picture is how many canons are or were there? Uh, was is Nicaea the, the big one? Or how many different oh, versions of Scripture? How many yeah. books of the Bible didn't make the, this particular canon? Canon. Yeah. Uh, well, can we just all, talk about some of that? Yeah, first of all, Nicaea did not vote on the canon. It was only on the creed. That was all the Nicaean oh. creed. The Nicaean meeting was just to try and unite the church behind a common creed. That was the only purpose of it. And it was created by the Emperor Constantine. He wanted one Christianity they could use to manipulate the whole empire, and he inherited this church that was divided. So he said, okay, you need to sort this out right now. I, you guys are all arguing about all this esoteric theological stuff. I want you to figure out one thing, and make, you're all going get to get behind that one. So they weren't settling on the actual scriptures, the, the basis no, of the Christian yet. faith at Nicaea? No, they weren't yet. Not officially. Um, officially, there were, I think there was later councils, 100 years or so after that, they they'd made official uh, pronouncements. But they had, already, they had already been narrowing in on a canon, or at least that particular sect was. There were other sects, we have to remember, that died out, that didn't survive. And so they had their own collection of text. And in fact, the first canon was the Martianite canon. It was actually the, the so-called heretics, even though their canon was first. Uh, so you had the Martianite canon, and really our canon, the one that we have inherited, was made by a rival sect that wanted to compete with his canon. Uh, and so it started out with slightly different selection of books, uh, like Hermas was in it. Um, there are these other weird treatises that people don't know about. And, and even the Old Testament would claim, com, contain books like Wisdom and Sirach, and, and there are these other the canon looked a little bit different then. And, but there are different Bibles. You look at like uh, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Vaticanus, um, and you look at the, um, what's in these things, uh, and what you see is that the collection of books is slightly different among them. So people are still producing Bibles with nearly the same collection of books, but some differences of decision. Nothing official had happened yet, but you can see it's narrowing in. And by the time you get to like Jerome in the late fourth century, it's clear there's been kind of a consensus has formed about what, in, in his sect, a consensus has formed as to what should be in the Bible. And then later that got confirmed uh, by councils. But then we have things like some of the Eastern churches still to this day keep three Corinthians in their canon, um, which is a forgery that most people have never heard of. Uh, the Ethiopian canon is ridiculous, crazy with weird stuff. Like it's it's the one of the weirdest canons you'll ever find. So there's a lot of odd, um, different, minor deviations. But you have to remember, 
most Christianity that evolved out of the Middle Ages came from that one sect and came from that one collection of books. Uh, and that's how it sort of developed. And even still, though, you've got, you've got the Catholic versus the Protestant versions of the Bible. Well, then I enjoy the, well, there's the King James, the New King James, the New yeah. American Standard. I mean... Well, yeah, translation. All translations are interpretations, right? There are so many versions of the truth with a capital T. Uh -huh. it's <laughs> the, you know, the flawed, subjective human hand is so evident. It's, mm -hmm. it's difficult for, for now on the other side of religion to see people embrace it as a perfect book. Mm -hmm. And yet people... People do. People yeah. often embrace the book as a, a divine edict, the actual word of God. Yeah, but I find most of those people don't read it. Um, they they just need it. They just need such a book to exist, and then they'll listen to other people telling them what's in it, even though it's not in there. Oftentimes, uh, these are people who often don't study the Bible. They just want that to be creedally true, doctrinally true. Because if it's not, then oh my gosh, what is true? Oh, it's chaos, right? Now I have to actually work. To figure stuff out, <laughs> you know. So, the comfort of knowing that there's a perfect book that r was revealed by God is, in itself, I think, a powerful motivator for people to say that. But generally, even scholars who say that, who are studiers of the Bible, you can see cracks uh, on the seams of where they have to kind of really bend over backwards to try and get it to be perfect, despite all of the, you know, the horrible, immoral passages, the contradictions. Um, all of that in there. Now, if someone comes to you and they say, fine, it's not a perfect book, but it's still the good book, mm -hmm. what would your response be to that? Oh, I would point them to my page, the 24 evil verses of the Bible, uh, the will of God. And this is where God is endorsing sex slavery in his word, like the word of God, like actually God is speaking in quotations. He's endorsing sex slavery. He's promoting uh, murder and terrorism in, uh, in opposition to freedom of speech and in opposition to freedom of religion. Uh, and and other horrible things, but those those are enough, really. And I think not only does that refute the Bible as being the word of any God worth worshiping, I think it refutes the existence of any such God, because if there was a God who was a good person, that God would not even allow this book to exist. He would not allow anyone to claim that he said these things. Like he would just, it just wouldn't happen. Like he, the books would dissolve the moment you tried to create them. Um, that, I think, would be the way the world would work. But the fact that someone can get away with manufacturing all of this evil stuff and selling it as God's word means there's no God policing what anyone says he says. Let's finish on a personal note. Have you always been a non-believer or skeptic in, let's say, religious faith in general? And I'm going to hold you to Christianity, but any faith at all. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Um, I was kind of a soft theist uh, for a while, and then maybe a little bit of a deist for a bit. Um, I, used to, I used to talk to God back when I also talked to trees because I thought trees had souls and you can, they, they can understand you. Uh, so this gives you an idea. Like when I was a kid, yes, yeah, you talk to God, you talk to trees, why not? Um, you know, I grew out of both of those uh, beliefs but, uh, and it grew into sort of a, a sort of deism, a vague deism. But I was never, I was raised liberal Christian, but I was never required to believe anything and I didn't really have any faith beliefs in that. My first real religion was Taoism and I had a really powerful religious experience that convinced me it was true and I was a devout Taoist for several years uh, until I realized that science could explain my experiences and that the Taoist philosophy is not perfect. And, and then I moved on to like atheistic philosophies because then I realized, well, okay, I've got to like figure this out uh, through philosophy. Well, where does this fascination with the Jesus story, with the Holy Bible, with uh, the exploration of the Christian scriptures and the cultures of that time, where does all that stem from? Well, originally, when I went back to college after the Coast Guard, um, I uh, first wanted to be a math, math teacher, but then the math courses were boring me. So I said, well, I like grammar. I, I'll be an English teacher. But then they make you read all these boring novels. And I was like, no, I don't want to be an English teacher. And uh, so I, while I'm exploring all of that, I'm doing all the basic ed requirements to get transferred to a four-year university. And so I'm doing all of this history. Uh, and history taught in college is so different than history taught in high school. High school, it's names and dates, it's memorization, it's boring as hell. Uh, but in college, no, it's cause and effect. It's why did these things happen? Um, and it's how do we know they happened? It's methodology. Those are way more fascinating questions. And so I was falling in love with history generally as a field. And when we were doing the Western Civ I, the unit on ancient Rome, the culture and the whole time and period, the fact that this civilization existed fascinated me to no end. And that became my passion. And at the same time, I was getting more and more involved in the atheist movement. And I realized, well, I could pursue this passion. It will just conveniently also give me the languages necessary to engage in Christian apologetics so I can inform my fellow atheists, like, are the, what, is what they're saying about the ancient Greek correct? Is what they're saying about the ancient world correct? So I thought I could 
you know, kill two birds with one stone, really, and do something that I'm passionate about and I really like, and be of use to the atheist community in doing counter apologetics. And so that's how I got into the whole study of the Bible. Then a lot of it's just really fascinating. Um, I, I'm, for example, I have much more uh, admiration for the Gospels as works of literature now than I did before this study uh, because I realize how brilliantly crafted these myths are um, and sometimes how beautiful the Greek is. But so, that, so that's how that got to there. But on the historicity of Jesus specifically, uh, that was in 2008. I got my PhD and then the economy collapsed and they were putting freezes on hires for professorships uh, or even eliminating positions. And so getting hired was very unlikely. So I uh, put out to my fans, I said, look, if you can raise $20,000 to eliminate my student debt up to that, up to that time, I'll, do, I'll apply my PhD to any research project you want. And they raised the money and said, historicity, unanimously, everybody, do historicity. We want you to apply your Columbia PhD. Tell us if there, there's any case here. Uh, and so that resulted in a six-year research project that resulted in three books. Um, and that's why I've been focused on this issue is because essentially I got a research grant to do it. What are the books specifically? Uh, Proving History, Bayes' Theorem and the Quest for the Historical Jesus, uh, Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, a collection of my papers related to the subject, peer-reviewed papers, magazine, and so on, and On the Historicity of Jesus, Why We Might Have Reason for Doubt. And that's, that's the big one that everyone was waiting for that capped the research project. There is an audio book of that, isn't there? Every book that is solely authored by me exists in audio read by me. How so, did yeah. you read the entire On the Historicity of Jesus? <laughs> it's huge. It took a lot of sessions. Uh, I can't do a whole day of reading. It's exhausting. So I do... Uh, like three or four hour sessions a day, and we did, I don't remember how many, it was a lot. Uh, so yeah, and that's thanks to Pitchstone, uh, by the way. Big props to Pitchstone, and I would highly recommend that people buy the audiobooks, because all my audiobooks are through Pitchstone. Uh, either buy my books or look at Pitchstone's catalog, buy more audiobooks, because they funded this. They put money to put me in a studio with an engineer to make really high quality audio, so they really invested money, and, and that was... Uh, really moving to me and very you know, like uh, risky, I thought, as a business decision. So I would love to see them profit from it like to, so that they will generate more audiobooks who are motivated to do that. So I encourage everyone, if you like audiobooks, get Pitchstone audiobooks for this reason. Real fast, just give me a pitch for On the Historicity or how, would, how could someone, a layperson, approach the Jesus question, the Bible question, and avoid the missteps as much as possible? Yeah, um, I think it's best if you're going to be interacting on the internet just to take an agnostic position and then familiarize yourself with what arguments are going to be made for historicity and just be aware of what the, what the counter arguments are. You don't have to be convinced of the mythicist thesis to do that. You can just create a stalemate position where you can say, well, this is the reasons you think Jesus existed, but they're not very strong. And just straightforward critical thinking skills and logic can lead you there. You don't need expertise in history as long as you've got the backing of the writings that I've produced, for example. Um, that's the best way to approach it unless you really want to dive in and do full research and really become really familiar with all of the arguments, which you can do if you have the time and the interest. <laughs>